Hey, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. Uh, as you can see, I'm back from vacation and uh, up to my head in uh, a cabinet project. I'm doing uh, a complete set of cabinets and shelves for a master closet project, and I've got them scattered around the shop here. These are various freestanding and hanging units with shelves for shoes, purses. There'll be some drawers later. They also have hanging spaces for various lengths and types of garments. All the cabinets are in various stages of assembly and I'm completing each process as I go through the main cutout. Then I've got all the dadoing and rabbiting and drilling shelf clip holes, etc. But now it's time to do all these short shelves uh, and then there's some cleats that get the edge banding as well. And I thought I'd go through the steps uh, that I use. When I started off, uh, this roll was 250 feet. Do a little math and that's almost 1 20th of a mile of edge banding. So the process I use has to be fast and efficient to make it worthwhile doing on all this, uh, doing on all these separate parts. A full-fledged cabinet shop has a Holzer edge banding machine and they just run the uh, shelves through as fast as they can feed them in there. I don't do enough of this stuff to justify that machine and um, the process with these simple tools to me is uh, a better value than getting even a portable um, edge banding station and I'll show you why. I don't have any experience with those. Somebody may have one and love it and recommend it, but um, I've always done it this way. As you'll see, I think, as I think you'll see, this is pretty fast and efficient, um, but the key to it all is the fact that the edges uh, are durable and reliable. Um, I've seen stuff come out of a, an edge banding machine, and if the tolerances in that machine are off a few thousandths of an inch, the edge banding sticks over the edge the first time you slide a pair of shoes off a shelf, twink, it, it pulls the edge banding off. So uh, the tools I use and the process I use eliminate that. I, I don't get callbacks for loose edge banding. And I want to show you how, um, how I go about that. Uh, you can make your own decision and decide what tools you're going to use. But for a fast, reliable edge, the system's tough to beat. And it's times like this when I've got a big cabinet project going on in the shop that I really wish I had a film crew. Uh, there's so much cool stuff going on. Um, from sizing big sheets, uh, full um, 47, or 48 and a half by 96 and a half inch sheets, sizing them down into precisely uh, identical parts like this, just with regular shop equipment. Uh, I've got the dado blade process, uh, shelf pin drilling, um, the planning and stuff. Uh, there's all those steps, but I just physically can't uh, do the work and film the video at the same time. But uh, I think this edge banding thing is important enough um, and common enough that it's worth stopping to show you the process. So let's get started with these pro tips for fast and efficient edge banding. I'll start by reviewing the tools and supplies here. The first and most important thing is the edge banding itself. And uh, I did a video previously, I'll put a link to it up here, uh, that shows how to make custom edge banding. Uh, I was doing a project with alder and I didn't want to buy a 250 foot roll of alder for just a few shelves. So I show how to make and apply custom edge banding in that video. Uh, but for this, because uh, everything is red oak, uh, red oak edge banding is readily available and a great value. That's what I'm starting off with. This red oak edge banding is a vertical grain, not a rotary cut. So it's got a fine grain structure on the back. It has a, a thick layer of hot melt adhesive on the back that's heated up with an iron, sticks like crazy. And you might wonder, where do they get a tree tall enough to make a 250 foot strip of edge banding in one continuous piece? Well, the secret is that they don't. This stuff is very cleverly finger jointed. In fact, there's a joint right here between my fingers. I'll zoom in and maybe you can see it. But on vertical grain wood with that finger joining, it's virtually invisible. And if I bend it, there's no way it's gonna crack because of the joint. So they probably use a flitch of uh, four, five, six feet long, finger joint it together and give me a continuous strip 250 feet long. Edge banding comes in various widths. This is uh, about seven eighths of an inch, which gives me a comfortable overhang on this three quarter inch stock. Uh, if I'm doing half inch material, basically all I can buy is the 7 8 width, so I end up trimming off a lot more. But they also have uh, this um, edge banding in a 2 inch width for um, other projects. But 7 8 inch works great for this 3 quarter inch material. Because of the sheer volume for this project, I made this little tape dispenser reel here. 
uh, like I said, this just unscrews. I can put a full 250 foot roll on here. And then when I pull this off, it's coming off clean and straight. It lays on the shelf edge uh, with those eight foot long uh, cabinet sides. That's really important. If you lay this stuff down on a bench and uncoil it, it always comes off twisted. So a tape dispenser reel like this one's real handy. I made this just so it clamps down for so I can position it for the work at hand. Here's a close-up shot of the tape dispenser reel. In case anybody's interested in making one. I didn't sand or varnish this yet. I just might. I like the design. Basically uh, a round donut in the middle is just a little bit smaller than the inside of my roll of oak edge banding. There's a relief in this piece right here so that the edge banding can spin around but not come off the reel. And then a block glued and screwed to the bottom allows me to clamp this in other positions. Not fancy but extremely effective. So for the list of tools and supplies obviously it starts off with that edge banding and the next most important feature is an iron. Uh, this is a little travel model that I've had for I don't know how long things kind of beat up but it's got good instant concentrated heat. The steam jets aren't too big. They don't get in the way of things. It's got a setting for temperature and it's got a lot of, lot of heat. Too hot to the touch. I'll mention it again but I generally set this like on wool to cotton to get the right amount of heat into the tape. After the iron the next tool is a J roller. This one's there's not a lot to this uh, but the wheel is a little bit cushioned. It has some forgiveness when rolling over the surface. I don't want a roller that's too hard or too soft but I can get two hands on this and get a lot of pressure to uh, compress the hot melt glue as it cools and for a nice permanent stick of the tape to the edge of the shelf. The next tool is uh, a pair of flush cut nippers. These are unlike um, electricians uh, side cutters because um, the, the edges are sharpened into a flat face. There's not like a double bevel that pinches the wire and what this allows is a flush cut to the end of a surface. So one snip uh, trims that edge banding quickly and nicely. Next tool is uh, a trimming blade. This trims the excess edge banding off the edge of the, um, the shelf and there's a lot of these on the market. Most of them try to get uh, fancy and have a double clamp system where it trims both edges at the same time but I find with those cutters the blade is thin and flexible and if you don't have the touch just so it digs into the wood and no amount of digging is worth the little extra speed that you can uh, potentially achieve by trimming both sides at once. I've had this uh, for four years. I just resharpened the blade the other day when I started this project. It's inexpensive, reliable, does a great job of uh, flush trimming. So that's the only one I use and recommend. The next tool I use is probably unique to me. Uh, this is a laminate file. I've had this one for 20 years. Can you believe it? And uh, I use that instead of sandpaper. After the edges are trimmed with a blade, uh, a lot of people use a piece of sandpaper. I don't like that because if there's an irregularity in the ed edge of the edge banding, the sandpaper just follows that irregularity. And you've got to do more work and you can over sand some areas and still not adequately sand all areas. So I use a file. You'll see, I'll uh, demonstrate that in a little bit. Uh, but I like it because it actually cuts off any excess edge banding trims it and I can also set an angle which you'll see later. Uh, this laminate file I'm trying to f uh, source these. I haven't been able to find these for 20 years. Um, this file is triangular. We can see that. Uh, this edge can actually be used like a saw for cutting in the corners and this edge has no teeth at all so I can file up into a corner and not over file in the wrong direction. Um, I guess I'll mention it here. Uh, the file can plug up with glue like you see here. So another tool that I keep at, on hand is a, a card file um, or a file card, sorry. And um, I use that for cleaning out any built up hot melt glue that gets into the, the file. But those two tools uh, probably account for 30% of the speed of this method versus sandpaper. Uh, the other thing that I do with the file uh, periodically I'll spray it with 100% silicone. Uh, this stuff is 
really got a lot of silicone in it. It's not just propellant, it's silicone. Uh, so I give that file a good spritz uh, at the end of the day or uh, at the beginning of a project and it helps release that glue a lot quicker and easier. Uh, two more incidental tools. Uh, I keep a sharp putty knife on hand. Uh, you'll see me use that later for cleaning up any residual glue that I might have missed. And uh, last but not least is uh, one of my best blocks for demanding sanding. This is 120 grit and I use that for um, rounding some edges and corners etc. So all the tools that I have so far, I use these on either uh, the plastic melamine edge banding or the wood. Um, at this point uh, I add one more tool and that is this big uh, cushy sanding block. This can be used right at the end um, for giving the edge banding itself just a little bit of texture uh, so stain will take to it. But uh, obviously you wouldn't want to use that on the melamine edge banding because it would just scratch it. And one of the distinguishing factors is that I do not use this block for the initial cleanup of the edge banding edges. It's not the right type of tool for cutting them clean and smooth. Well that should cover the uh, tools and an overview of the edge banding process. So I'm going to go ahead and do a couple of these shelves. I'll move my little edge banding dispenser over here. Nothing magic about that. Um, the first thing uh, in the process that I'll mention is that uh, to get good results, you have to have good cuts. Uh, if, you, if your blade has wane in it or your rip fence isn't lined up and you get saw marks in the wood, they'll just telegraph through the edge banding tape. If they're any more than a 32nd of an inch, they'll show through the edge banding. So uh, step one in quick professional edge banding is uh, smooth edges. Um, I like to work in a vertical orientation rather than clamping something down and doing it on the side. I've got this handy vise here that takes care of that. Here's a close-up shot of a crisp, clean, square, smooth edge that's ready for edge banding. And I'll mention right now that all these initial steps are the same whether you're using um, melamine edge banding on uh, particle board or the wood edge banding. There's one step at the end that's different between the two. The first step I always do after clamping the board is to wipe the edge just to make sure there aren't any loose splinters of wood or sawdust on there. Generally a wood or particle board will have a nap to it uh, depending on the way that it was run through the table saw. Uh, it'll be kind of like fish scales. You brush one way and it's smooth and the other way you can kind of feel it's rough but I just wipe that off make sure there's no uh, chips or splinters on there. Naturally the next step is to grab a piece of edge banding the right length. I don't bother cutting this. I make it about a half three quarter inch long and just snap it off to get a piece of edge banding that's wider and longer than the edge being covered. This arrangement with the vise and the dispenser works great. The longer the piece, uh, the simpler and quicker that makes the process. The next step is to use uh, a hot iron to activate the glue. Soften it, melt it, whatever you call it. So I just position this on here with a little hanging over each side and a little hanging over each end. The iron is set to wool slash cotton. That iron is way too hot to touch, but I want to get a lot of heat into that edge banding in a hurry. I'm just giving it medium pressure and when, when the edge banding is too hot to leave my hand on it, I know I've got enough heat in it. Um, I use firm pressure on the flat surface and then I'll rock the iron on each edge like this to seal the glue down at the edge and then give it a quick little rock on each end. This um, tape is really quite hot. I take the J-roller, give it firm pressure on the flat and then a little roll on each edge just to seal those edges down because I don't want them to um, flake off later. By the time I'm done rolling the glue is um, cooled enough so that it's stuck on here. So I can take the flush trim nippers, I hold the flat back side of the cutters up against the end of the shelf, give it a nice clean snip and I try to hang on to the piece as I cut it off. Naturally I do both ends and these snips are nice and sharp. I've had these for a number of years. They're still cutting like new. If you happen to misalign that and get a crooked cut, this thing will snip just about nothing off of there. I don't know how much that was, if you can see that. But they really do trim flush. So even if you don't get it lined up the first time, you get a second chance. 
And I like to keep a garbage can handy and throw the off cuts in there as I go. Just keep things a little neater around the shop. By zooming in, you can see the end is cut flush now and the sides edges are hanging over a little bit. That's just how I want it so that I can trim that off with this little tr trimmer. And I've got links to all these tools, the best I can find in the video description uh, through Amazon where they're the same low online price to you, but Amazon pays a small ad fee to help support videos at this channel. So if you need any of them, can't find them locally, pick them up there through a link and I thank you for the support. But with this little tool, trimming this edge off is as quick as that. I do both sides and if I have any doubt that I missed something, I can always go backwards because this cuts this cuts go in both directions. But that gets the edge clean to what I'd say is 98%. But you can still feel the difference between the face of the wood and the edge banding. You might be able to see it here. This edge is just ever so slightly sticking out. And a commercial machine, if it's not set right, it'll leave that little edge and that's what gets caught and tends to chip off. So I want to deal with it. And the way I deal with it is that laminate file that I talked about. I'm holding it at about a 15 degree angle to this face and I'm giving a consistent downward stroke. And once, and you can hear the difference when it's done cutting the edge banding. It, it's a smoother, cleaner sound. I don't even know how to describe that, but when you're doing this, you'll be able to tell the difference. So I've cleaned off any edge banding that's protruding. There's a slight angle on it, but there's still a sharp corner here. So I tilt the file, file to about a 45 degree angle and give it a little wipe. Now I've got a flush edge that's not sharp in those few strokes. The backside's a little harder to do because it's hard to hold the file like this and get a good cut. So I just start off with the file tilted in that 15 degrees. You might be able to hear the difference as that slight edge is cut off. And when you're doing this, you can tell a distinct difference of how the file slides across that veneer when there's no edge banding sticking out. So I've got a couple strokes to put the 15 degree angle and one more to put a 45 on it. Now these edges are completely flush, nothing there to snag when things are drug on and off the shelves. I'll take a final pass to make sure there isn't a burr on this edge. I just hold the file tight to the end and push. That trims off anything. And then a very light nip uh, eases that edge. So when the shelves are being put in and out, there's nothing on the end to catch and pull off. Second verse, same as the first. Flush trim, bevel, bevel, bevel done. And I've got to say, it's a little bit frustrating to get comments sometimes about how long something takes when the viewer doesn't account for the fact that I'm explaining things. So this is how long this process takes when I'm not walking through it step by step. Clamp the board, wipe the edge, snap the tape, iron it on, it's too hot to touch, hit the edges, hit the ends, roll it out. That helps seal the edges down and a couple quick snips of the ends. Takes care of that. I got the tape a little offset there that time. You can see there's a little more trim off on the back than the front. And that's all it takes. After completing those steps, if I have any doubt that there's still uh, hot melt glue on the surface, I take a sharpened putty knife and just give a quick wipe. I don't have to do that very often, uh, but it'll, it'll catch if you miss anything on that edge. You'll feel the knife slow down 
and you know you need a little more attention. But once you're practiced at it uh, and done it a while, one, two, three, it's, it's a quick deal. As I said earlier, everything from the beginning to this step is the same for doing melamine edging on a particle board with melamine on it and wood. Uh, the last thing I do here is to take this uh, squishy soft 120 grit uh, sanding block. I'll link to this too. It's a great sander, but uh, the iron can tend to burnish the surface of the wood here. So I just take a couple licks so that that surface is roughened up a little bit for when I stain it so that the stain takes evenly on all the surfaces. When I was going through that sequence, I forgot to mention, um, I wanted to highlight the difference between a file for cleaning up the edges and sandpaper. A lot of people use sandpaper um, after the trimming step, but that edge can be irregular, especially on a splintery wood like oak. And by taking sandpaper, it tends to follow the wood and not cut that off. Sometimes it over sands and gets into the veneer, which I don't like. Other time it just kind of smears the glue around. So I don't like sandpaper for the uh, for the cleanup after the trimmer. Uh, use a file, it makes a lot of difference and um, it's a lot faster. I wanted to show a couple more things here. Um, one is for a piece like this, uh, this is a shelf cleat, the closet rod goes about here and I want to put the edge banding on the end and the bottom of this piece. It's got really crisp corners from the way I made the parts uh, and I want to ease those up a little bit. So I clamp this firmly and I'll zoom in to show how I use this 120 grit sanding belt on this block. If you want to know how to build sanding blocks like this that firmly hold a belt sander belt, um, there's a link to the video that I did showing you how to make these. But here's a perfect application for this. I just hold it flat on the surface and roll that sharp corner. If I was to use a soft, squishy sanding block like this, it would kind of round off the edges and not get, make for a good fit. You can do the same to this. Just a quick wipe breaks the sharpness of those corners. The edge banding process is similar. Got a little hanging off the end, a little hanging off the sides. Plenty of heat, a little bit of pressure. If the wood is cold or the iron is cold, the, the tape keeps peeling up. If the tape gets misaligned, just make sure it's good and hot and peel it up and recenter it. It's hot. Um, as long as that glue is pretty pliable, it, uh, you can peel it off and stick it back on. I'm going to use the pressure and heat from the iron to roll that corner. And this tape doesn't really want to stick on those curves so well. But because I broke the edge on that a little bit, you can use plenty of pressure, plenty of heat. Just double check that to make sure I got it hot enough that I can't keep my hand on there. And that means the glue is soft enough to really melt down into the fibers of the wood that I'm edge banding. Can trim these guys off. It's a little hard to line that up with the camera. And this might be another example of why uh, the single edge trimmer is better than the doubles. You might need this anyways. So I'm going to trim this edge off and I have to be careful going around these corners. It's kind of a sharp corner for this tool to get around, but it does a good job. Could also, oops, there goes my scrap on the floor. If that process loosens the glue, I just hit it again with the iron, a little more pressure to kind of put it back where I want it. You can hit it again with the roller if you need to, just to make sure it's really stuck on there. And then I'll carefully file this too. I'm always filing onto the wood. If I file the other way, it can flick that edge loose. And this is hard to do, uh, trying to show it in the camera at the same time, but you get the idea. A little 15 degree bevel, a 45 to take the sharpness off of it, rounding those corners a little bit. 
and I didn't do very good on these ends but I can take them down with a file and with a couple licks and that shows you how a block like this is handy for this sort of work. I might as well say that the reason I don't use this sandpaper even though it's stiff and hard the reason I don't like to use it for cleaning up the edges is because it tends to really clog up with glue and it's harder to clean the sanding belt than the file. As I mentioned I keep this uh, file card on hand. I always want to call it a card file uh, but that'll clean out the pores of the file quite nicely when the glue builds up like that. This even has a little pointed uh, pick on there if some of that stuff really gets jammed in the file. This is good for uh, cleaning any file but these in particular. Like I said I'll link to these tools um, in the video if it's something you need and I'm still trying to source this file. I've uh, put out a couple questions on Amazon uh, but nobody can tell me if their file has this triangular profile or if it's rectangular but I'll find it. While I'm on the subject of file um, maintenance I'll just show uh, this silicone spray. It's 100% silicone spray. I just dust the file with it. Being careful not to get any of the silicone on my projects and if I do this at the end of the day rather than the beginning uh, the carrier is all evaporated out, the file is slick and that glue won't build up near as much uh, while I'm doing a bunch of this work even if the glue is still a little warm and soft from uh, ironing it on. Well as you can see I've got my work cut out for me here uh, finishing up these shelves and those cleats. I'm sure I'm going to be through that uh, 120th of a mile roll of edge banding by the time I get done with this project. Uh, so um, if you like the video I hope you'll consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already so that um, you'll know when uh, videos with more tips like this come up uh, and while you're at it poke that thumbs up button uh, so YouTube knows something's going on. Uh, these are exciting times for Next Level Carpentry. I'm kind of on a countdown or a count up to 100,000 subscribers which I'm really excited about and I want to thank all you uh, viewers and subscribers who've been with the channel for a week or four years. Um, for being a part of the growth of the channel. Um, without you guys this doesn't happen so I really appreciate it. Uh, if you're interested in any swag I'm sporting my new Next Level Carpentry large logo t-shirt with the Master Carpenter Qualified by Experience uh, logo on the back. You can get those in the link below the video or go to Teespring where you can get uh, the t-shirt or uh, a few great stickers like this one I keep on uh, some of the power machines in the shop. Um, there's some other swag there on the uh, on the Teespring site if you're interested in any of that. I want to mention that uh, it seems like the t-shirts run a little small. Uh, this is an extra large. I'm not a big guy, 5'10". Uh, if normally I wear a large. This is extra large. It fits great. It's a nice uh, light uh, quality fabric for working in the summer. It keeps me cool. And so if you're interested in that check out the swag. Um, those uh, sales help support the channel as well and I appreciate it. I want to give a special thanks to the patrons on Patreon. Uh, you guys have gone above and beyond to help uh, encourage me to um, build the channel and keep things moving along here. I'm looking forward to the time where I can devote uh, all my time to Next Level Carpentry and uh, not focus so much on the, the paying jobs. That's my dream and you're helping make it possible so thank you. So I'm going to keep after this till I get it done and tell you until next time thanks for watching.
That's all, folks. <laughs>